um, tonight for tonight for being here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night to to everyone that is going to participate today to this webinar. I, I really have the pleasure to present Jason Ward. He belongs to the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Surgery, Radiology, and Biomedical Engineering. He's Associated Scientist of, uh, of the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center, Associate Director uh, to the Small Animal Imaging Shared Facility, and Scientist uh, to the UAB Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Uh, and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He's going to talk about uh, today about the new trends in progressing eye surgery. This is going to be um, more a discussion, like, like a, a, a really lecture. So I invite everybody to ask questions and, and to participate. So Jason, thank you very much to, for being here. If you want to start, uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Dib. Thank you to the society for the invitation to be able to speak tonight. Thank you for everyone who's cut out some time at the end of their day, um, in, at least in this time zone, uh, to partake in this discussion. Uh, and so what I've been tasked with is kind of describe, describing new trends in fluorescent scattered surgery. This is by no means a comprehensive and exhaustive uh, taste of, of what the new trends are. These are more trends that I thought were interesting. And so since I was asked to do the talk, I got to pick them. So, um, so let's start first with, um, with the market. Uh, fluorescent scattered surgery is, uh, is a, one of the fastest growing markets is currently in North America. Uh, Motor Intelligence in 2021 did a study where they uh, assessed the uh, compound annual growth rate of the fluorescent scattered surgery market uh, over the next five years and produced a growth rate of 17.8%. Uh, with the with the majority of the growth anticipated in the last five years to occur in the Asia Pacific region, um, with the North America region following close behind, um, this uh, sort of trending interest over the next five years in the in the in the technology market uh, is kind of supported by what the NIH is doing here in the states in terms of uh, funding. Uh, fluorescent scattered surgery uh, clinical trials, preclinical experiments, onboarding new technologies, agents, devices. Uh, and as you can see, the funding has tripled over the past six years with the majority in 2022 of uh, funding coming from the National Cancer Institute with 20 million with five sub projects. Uh, this is very exciting, particularly here in the US to see that the, uh, the funding agencies are, are taking a serious interest uh, and we anticipate that growth to continue, specifically as new agents and devices become uh, FDA approved and uh, routine use in patients. This trend also continues with publications, which you can pull up PubMed and do a quick search on fluorescent scattered surgery and understand what um, the publication rate has been over the over the last decade, two de several decades. Uh, and as shown here, the the publications in the fluorescent scattered surgery area have doubled every seven to eight years, uh, which is which is also very exciting and, and trending towards uh, more uh, scientific exposure as well as just the public domain exposure as well. I think one of the most exciting things that has happened in fluorescent scattered surgery over the last year uh, is certainly the approval of Citalux, uh in October of 2021, I believe. Uh, and this is the anti folate receptor alpha uh, agent that was originally designed and produced uh, by Phil Lowe at Purdue. And so congratulations to him and his team and what they've been able to do. Uh, this has been the holy grail for several decades to bring an, uh, an act, a, a truly active targeted uh, uh, agent for surgical oncology. And for this one, they, they were able to, able to approve it at, uh, over two years, nine institutions, at a phase two trial um, where they dosed and fluorescently imaged 134 patients. And notably within those 134, 36 had at least one a valuable ovarian cancer lesion detected with Citalux that was not observed by standard visual or tactile inspection. Um, this, is, this is what the, uh, the FDA has been asking us to produce in terms of uh, patient benefit metrics that will um, eventually lead to long-term survival. 
interestingly, the uh, false positive rate was determined to be 20% uh, in, in these patients as well, which is, which is interesting that the, um, the sensitivity was still enough to overcome and, and achieve FDA approval based on these metrics. Um, moving on to uh, ICG, uh, there's a lot of new and exciting things that I, have been happening to ICG over the past few decades, particularly in uh, using them for surgical oncology and therapy. Uh, one of these uses is uh, encapsulating ICG in nanoparticles, various, various uh, formats of metal, uh, nanoparticles from uh, silica to polymer to lipid. And these are inorganic and organic varieties with improved stability and retention, particularly for the ICG uh, for localizing disease tissue. Uh, a lot of them initially start off as pa passive targeting, but some have developed active, active targeting strategy, uh, strategies with peptides, antibodies, and various other moieties. Uh, and then drug combinations for theranostics, and ICG is on board uh, during this whole process. And the, th the theranostics and therapy um, story is interesting because uh, with the ICG, we could potentially measure uh, image guided drug delivery um, with these nanoparticles. Uh, another exciting study that I saw, albeit 2016 in ACS Nano, was the use of these biomimetic nanoparticles that were composed of extracellular cancer cell membrane for uh, homologous targeting, uh, again, using the encapsulation of the ICG. Uh, and in these, in these preclinical studies, they were able to show that um, through passive extravasation and that homologous targeting of the cancer, uh, using basically the skin from the cancer cell, uh, they were able to, to get these nanoparticles into the cancer uh, for both dual modality imaging and photothermal therapy. Uh, this is, this is uh, another exciting trend that I think is, is, is going to be evident in the future is, um, is the addition of a therapeutic agent uh, that's coupled in some way to the uh, fluorescence targeted agent uh, so that you get localization and therapy combined in one procedure. Uh, as, as those of us who have worked with this targeting um, fluorescence agents uh, in real time in, in patients, um, there's, there's very little hope that the sub, you know, sub millimeter islands of, of cancer cells are gonna be detected using, using the fluorescence particularly if they're occult lesions or skip lesions or then areas that are covered by normal tissue. But the addition of a therapeutic uh, uh, a piece that's on board the vehicle um, could be used to take care of those, those smaller um, uh, regions that you won't be able to visualize, but you can reach it with therapy. And photothermal therapy, photodynamic therapy are, are modalities that would be easily translatable to do this. Uh, another interesting uh, trend, uh, particularly this, this study here I found interesting. This is from Dr. John Lee at UPenn, who have been doing second window imaging for some time. Uh, and the concept is, is they, uh, they um, infuse with uh, five mix per keg in patients 24 hours prior to surgery. Uh, and then they have a two and a half mg per keg patient here that's also shown. And with a five mix per keg uh, after 24 hours, you get through enhanced permeability effect, uh, you get some nice pooling in the cancer and the tumor itself, uh, even to the point where you can detect it with under the intact dura uh, during these procedures. And you can see that there's, um, there's less specificity with the two and a half milligram per keg uh, cohort. Uh, in addition to um, the nomenclature second window imaging. There's NIR2 imaging that um, is is also uh, quick on the horizon to to enable uh, in, improved depth of penetration, resolution, sensitivity. Uh, many of these fluorescent molecules and proteins that we use um, have a have an additional emission spectrum that runs into the NIR2 window. Um, the problem is is that. Um, up till now, that, is, that has been uh, very difficult to detect with certain sensors, but with the release of the indium gallium arsenide, the NGAS uh, sensors from the Department of Defense who have been up till now uh, 
secretly keeping them for drone and uh, satellite imaging uh, have now become more commercially available. And so these in-gas receptors allow for us to, uh, to detect uh, in the in the 300 nanometer range, and you can kind of see juxtaposed the 850 with the 1300 and the, the additional uh, sensitivity and depth of penetration, uh, the identification of small vessels, things like that, because the background is extremely low. And so you've really improved your signal to noise ratio when you're up into this uh, NI or two window. After a lot of uh, of searching uh, through the literature, I, I came across one study that is um, using this in Kyoto, or no, this is this is Beijing, this is China, uh, where they uh, were using the NIR2 window and these uh, mediastinal tumor resections. Um, and they were able to recognize the deeper position of the subclavian vein and artery to avoid vascular damage during the operation. Uh, in addition, the clear blood vessel borders visualized in the NIR2 with ICG angiography uh, showed the subclavian vein and artery were dissected free of all surrounding tissues uh, without any vascular injury. Uh, up, till, up, to, up to date, uh, there are very few uses of this NIR2 uh, in the literature and in patients, but it's something that is uh, definitely coming around the corner uh, as, as device manufacturers and chips in general become more sensitive. Um, Jason, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You know, I, I have a, a, a question. So for the people that are not used to the technology or are starting, can you explain us or tell us a little bit more about what would be the difference between using ICG for tumor detection, for example, or a, something that is uh, combined or with an antibody or a second window? Uh, you know, method to use the technology or would, you know, a surgeon would prefer or in what case? Sure, sure. So um, each of these agents have different properties, obviously, and the properties will uh, determine um, not, not just the sensitivity uh, and the tumor targeting or disease or anatomical structure targeting that you're, you're wanting to achieve, um, but also the, the dose the time, the timing, uh, when is that dose given um, for uh, agents that have vehicles such as antibodies, for example, that have two and a half day half-lives, um, those, those uh, agents have to be given 24, 48 hours prior to surgery, whereas ICG uh, is much smaller, clears faster, uh, can be given during the surgery if you want to highlight anatomical structures. The thing that uh, UPenn is doing is they're um, they're taking advantage of the tumor's enhanced permeability effect to retain um, this ICG. Uh, that's just free ICG, but it's pooling in the tumor. And when you give a large bolus of that ICG over time, it collects and it doesn't wash out as fast as the surrounding tissue. And so at five mix per keg at 24 hours, they found that they've achieved a, a great deal of contrast. Now, we could talk about the specificity of that contrast. Um, particularly in GBM, the, you know, in GBM, and then they're doing it also in thoracics and, and perhaps others. Um, but the specificity of the of the contrast with the second window ICG is it just is it just highlighting the internal portions of the tumor? Is it is it is it also an infiltrative edge? Um, these are areas that are that are much more susceptible to targeted binding, active targeting binding. So moving on, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was multispectral imaging, which um, over the last 10 years, uh, there's several groups that have been experimenting with this, um, either uh, using uh, tandem agents that will highlight, say, uh, nerve or disease together. Uh, here's an example of uh, uh, Michael Bouvet from UCS UCSD, who's done a study um, uh, highlighting the use of multispectral imaging with agents that uh, highlight background tissues in order to elucidate uh, tumor-specific targeting imaging. And these, these structures that um, you could highlight include, the, I have a list there at the left, um, but in the case of whole organ, um, Dr. Bruvet's group used ICG, which they injected into these uh, liver met containing mice 
and then followed that up with an anti-CEA uh, antibody with a 700 dye. And then they were able to use terminal liver ratios uh, to basically um, produce a, a, a metric that could discern whether or not there were uh, true positive liver mets present or just uh, normal liver. Uh, and there's there's several examples of these in the literature, and certainly this isn't exclusive, but um, Mike's a good friend of mine, so I wanted to use his study to include. Um, the other um, the other thing that's that's on the horizon has been there for a while, but it's it, the nerve imaging that I'm seeing now, specifically uh, from Dr. Summer Gibbs group out of OHSU, uh, where they're using these oxine derivatives um, to both apply directly in a topical format uh, to highlight nerves during surgery and also systemic injections. And they're producing extremely high contrast with their libraries that can be paired at different wavelengths with, with any other tumor or disease specific agent that you wanna use in combination. Uh, and they've, they've been showing a lot of success of this in the preclinical realm. Um, and even here using the Da Vinci robot uh, which is which is set up to image in the fluorescent spectrum and the NIR spectrum, uh, and they're able to highlight several nerves in these uh, these swine studies. Uh, moving from multispectral, we can go to multimodality imaging, and so here is a, here's an example of a study that we're doing in collaboration uh, with Dr. Jerome Rao at Stanford, um, who has produced this elegant peptide. Uh, that has a cleavage site for MMP14 target as well as a binding site. And what happens is um, the fluorescence peptide, which is which is normally quenched, uh, is then activated by the MMP14 en enzyme. And then uh, the binding of it allows for nuclear imaging in the form of, of a PET radio tracer. And that way we can uh, we can do pre preoperative PET imaging. Um, that aligns with the intraoperative fluorescence imaging, uh, and then as well as postoperative PET imaging to determine the extent of the tumor resection. Um, and again, we picked uh, GBM here uh, to show the uh, utility of using this multimodality agent. Again, this is just one example. Uh, there's several examples, um, uh, decades old of of uh, antibody-based dual modality imaging where they're using a fluorescence molecule uh, and a uh, PET radio tracer conjugated to a single uh, full-size monoclonal antibody that can target disease and provide multimodality um, utility. Um, the, the other trend that I'm seeing happening over the last five years uh, has been the movement of of the fluorescence guided surgery into pathology, a lot of these agents that are being used survive formal fixation. Uh, in addition to prior to formal fixation during intraoperative assessment, the and the innate characteristics of these tumor tissues to have the fluorescence probe uh, bound to these cancer cells can be used by the pathologist to localize um, disease for intraoperative assessment. Uh, this is an example of a prototype device that was developed by LIPOR um, where semi-tomographic images could be taken. And you can imagine um, if, if the surgeon has resected a couple of, of margins that are now headed to the Frozen's lab, um, this, these margins can be imaged and this, uh, this video can, can accompany the margin uh, to the pathologist to um, to help highlight and localize specific areas of that tissue that the pathologist wants to cert, uh, uh, sample. Again, this is to reduce sampling error. And then in the histological world, uh, the presence of the fluorescence where the disease is contained also helps uh, with discordance uh, when two pathologists don't agree on whether or not there's tumor lo localized on the slide. Jason, I, I believe this is a really very important because I, well, I personally I do uh, surgical oncology. And one of the reasons we still have recurrences in the tumor is because sometimes we left a tumor behind when we are operating. Uh, sometimes we have the frozen section that is negative and, and you know, at the end, it probably is not. And I believe this is going to give us much more information. So my question is, where are we now with this technology? So it is available in the US, uh, you know, when it's going to be available, 
uh, you know, it's going to be expensive or not. It's going to be useful for all the patients. So how we envision this uh, application in the daily practice? Uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, from the regulatory standpoint, um, for example, Citalux, uh, those, those uh, ovarian cancer, um, most of those procedures are cytoreduction and debulking. Uh, but there are margins that come in, come in those cases. Um, and while the FDA has approved the use of Citalux for uh, localization intraoperatively, um, it's, it's sort of unknown um, where the FDA uh, guidance would be on the use of it in, in pathology. Um, and and I, I think someone needs to just step out there and then uh, and set the precedent of, of of what that regulatory guidelines would look like. For our studies that we do, uh, we have um, we have a pathological path, pathology component that's written into our protocols, uh, so that we can we can do this extra imaging uh, in pathology in a histology uh, setting, so that uh, we can we can show them, you know, where the tissue where the tumor tissue is relative to normal. The other thing that we've been doing recently, in order to capture the patient benefit, I think the FDA is, is if, if you approach the FDA with the use of this technology and pathology, they're going to they're going to define the metrics that they're looking for for patient benefit. And uh, if it, if it follows the surgery portion, then uh, in pathology it would be did the fluorescence uh, allow identification of missed cancer that would have otherwise been not seen. So. So one of the things that we're doing here is even, even when uh, these specimens or the, the specimen, the, the main specimen where the, the primary is, is, is sampled in different areas to make sure that there's no disease at the cut edge, um, we are taking those blocks and we are imaging them. So we're imaging the, the cancer or the, the tissue that wasn't uh, selected for histology. And so we're showing the uh, pathologist there are suspicious areas in this block that we imaged because the fluorescence is still alive. And then they go back in, they cut a few more sections and, and lo and behold, they find tumor. This is what the FDA wants to see. This is, this is us making those steps because left cancer is, is already known to reduce uh, long-term survival. And how many times, you know, uh, you you say, okay, in the frozen section and the pathology, I, I believe this is negative. And then when you use the probe, it's positive. So how well this is, you know, it's going to be in the future, 20, 10%, 20%, 20%. How is our margin of the error that we can make? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, a lot of a lot of the error will come with false positives. I, I as the Citalux study showed, uh, the sensitivity for all these applications are going to be very high. Uh, but the false positive rate, and we've experienced that as well. But the reason why we've experienced it is because we're still learning about what structures in the head and neck are going to give us a false positive rate, whether it be lymph nodes, lymph lymphatic tissues, um, pituitary gland, salivary gland. Um, you know, just, just cutaneous skin itself will, will look brighter than, than muscle, for example, when you're targeting EGFR like we are here. So uh, it's, it's, it's more, to reduce the false positives is more being educated about uh, where your agent goes and what, what that false positive will look like in tissue that's not tumor containing. And, and honestly, I think um, once that's understood, you'll see those false positive rates go way down. But I can't give you a number. I wish I could. Yeah. But, but it's coming. I believe, you know, this is the future. Yeah. Something I was thinking when, you know, uh, we were, um, you know, telling us uh, about these technologies. One of the, the issues or the problems that we have with the, this kind of technology is that we don't have enough penetration of the light in the tissues. So basically when we are operating, I wish to see, you know, the... Uh, the the tissue uh, the positive tissue behind so uh, what what is the the solution to that it's going to be a solution or a combination of lights or technology in order to see uh, you know through really through the tissue uh, actually or we're going to be still in the surface 
I, I think with because we're in the optical range, we're we're always going to be limited, um, and and that's why, um, it, particularly here in the head and neck cancer world, where most head and neck cancer has the highest number of intraoperative assessments per case than any other tumor type, um, and in those cases. Um, the, as you know, the, the margins that are sent for intraoperative assessment are very small, very thin, um, and they do that in order for them to load the entire tissue on the, the, the chalk and then be able to sec section into it. But if you get it, if you get it anything bigger than than you know a half a centimeter to a centimeter, we're always going to be limited. Now. When we pair these, when we pair these, like in the in the multimodality universe, uh, where we can pair these uh, fluorescence agents with um, nuclear agents that are going to provide us that depth of penetration, there are systems that are that are de that are developed and in place now in, in in the back of ORs that will allow you to image radioactivity in specimens. There's there's wands. There's there's several things that are already there. So. Uh, the fluorescence localizes the nuclear component, allows you to see whole body, whole tissue. Uh, and, and so then you have to work out how to use those in tandem, which I think is, is something that we discuss here all the time. And, and I think will continue to be a discussion. There has to be, we have to capture the synergy that we know is present in multimodality imaging during surgery. Excellent. And, and you know what, uh, there is, uh, I think about, you know, the the daily practice and what we do. And we were like studying and using this kind of technology for a while now. And I always, uh, you know, we, we always ask the, the same question, when this is going to become a standard of care? Yeah. So because, you know, the, the, the data that we are having now is pretty obvious, you know, this is uh, better than seen with white light. We are giving, you know, getting more and more information. So my question to you is, what are really, and, and what we, when we analyze the curve of the, the adoption of the technology, it's yeah. pretty slow, you know, and it's amazing that it's so slow. Uh, more and more people, and you, you demonstrated us that there are more and more publications. So this is telling us that there's an increase of the use of the technology. But why is that so, you know, why, why is so slow, uh, if we can say that it's slow? Uh, why, my question is, why is that so fast? Uh, so, you know, it's faster. So what, what are the barriers? So what should we do in order to, like, get people adopt this technology faster? Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot. And I think um, every time we come together and we, we put our heads together, um, there seems to be a new challenge, and um, and 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 likewise, there seems to be um, suggested resolutions that we that we chase down. Um, I've been on the bandwagon that, uh, well, two things. One, um, we're still ahead of the curve. We're we're still way ahead of the curve. We're way ahead way ahead of the technology's uh, you know widespread adoption, and. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe that's a testament to, you know, ours and our mentors foresight to know that this was, this is the technology that's going to change surgery. Um, and, and so that's going to take some time. People didn't adopt the internet very quickly either. Um, they didn't see the utility for it. They didn't understand why you needed uh, email, for example. Now we can't live without it. Uh, so I, I think uh, the first point is that we're still ahead of the curve, way ahead of the curve. The second point is that, um, the patients need to drive this, the adoption of this technology. Uh, there's only a handful of surgeons at any institution that see this technology and say, you know what, I think I could really use that. The, the rest of them uh, already feel like they can, they can do the procedure, they can, with their expertise and training, they know where the tumor is, they know where the structure is, they know where the blockage is, they don't need this added tool. Um, and, and as you know, uh, time is money in the, in the OR. And so any, any additional tool has to be weighed against the time and the sacrifice. And so if you do a cost benefit analysis, the majority of surgeons and hospitals for that matter, uh, aren't gonna see the benefit right away. But if patients drive it, then the patients are gonna go to the institution that's using this technology before they travel six blocks to the other institution that doesn't. And so 
the, the hospital administrators at all are gonna, gonna come to the realization that the marketing needs to be done. It's the same thing that happened with the robot. Uh, Intuitive said, here it is. You need to market it now. Now patients will travel uh, to have the robotic surgery because that's the technology that they know is the most successful and minimally invasive. So that's my two cents. Okay, well, excellent, thank you. If you want sure. to continue, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, sp speaking of the robot, um, another example of the use of this technology that's trending uh, is, is in robotic procedures. Uh, and this is an example of, of a case that we did some months ago uh, in a patient that had a rad radical uh, tonsillectomy because uh, he had tumor containing tonsil. Uh, and this is using um, penitumumab iodide 100 that was infused 48 hours prior to surgery. And with the Firefly technology, the imaging, the imaging technology that's contained on the, on the robot, uh, we're able to, which has come a long way in, in just the past decade um, in terms of hardware and software advancements. Uh, it used to be pretty poor, but as you can see now, uh, it's gaining a lot of sensitivity. Uh, and a lot of the background has been washed out. And we're kind of showing this tumor fragment that was left in the wound bed, uh, juxtaposed to the, um, the imaging, uh, the, the tool um, that we sort of lay in place and use as a normalization factor. Um, so, so this, and, and we're expanding this technology into other uh, head and neck procedures and, and as well into to, uh, laparoscopic procedures uh, using uh, robotic surgery. Um, the next key point that I wanted to mention was the surgeon patient, uh, the, I call it the surgeon patient interface, but it's really the surgeon technology interface. Um, and with the FDA approving the Microsoft HoloLens for augmented reality system for surgical use, this, this is on the horizon. Uh, I think the days where the surgeons are, are holding some camera and then trying to uh, co-register what they see on the camera with, 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 with what's inside the patient are, are, are nearing their end and they need to involve where the information is integrated into uh, this, the surgeon's senses. And one way to do that would be the HoloLens in an augmented reality setting. Additionally, there are other people that are ahead of this. Um, I, I know Sam uh, Achilifu, uh, previously at WashU, I forget where he is now. Um, he, uh, he has been working on this technology uh, there's the medical imaging projection system. Uh, this is a group in, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, that are using ICG emission signal and, and active pro uh, projection mapping uh, in these uh, hepatectomy procedures. So, uh, and this is more for the device crowd. Um, how, how, how are we going to provide the information to the surgeon seamlessly uh, that doesn't interrupt uh, the, the surgery? Um, that is that is not invasive. That is not bulky. Um, this is this is a big question for device manufacturers moving forward. Uh, and and finally, my last point I wanted to talk about was characterizing benefit, uh, which is something that m my group and others have been have been charging um, forward on. Uh, and this is this is an example of a great review that was produced last year uh, by uh, several groups in in the Netherlands. Uh, and their point is, is they wanted to es establish and define metrics, uh, giving recommendations for the evaluation of changes in, in interoperative decision making. If we follow uh, what the FDA told us uh, several years ago uh, about what did they wanted to see in terms of uh, patient benefit in order to, to achieve approval, uh, it was always margins. Does the technology allow you to identify margins that would have otherwise gone missing? And for our trial and others, and certainly the Citilux trial in nine institutions, uh, they adopted this as well. Uh, the other, but the problem is, is that while that metric is great for the FDA to, to you know, officially uh, classify in black and white the benefit, rather than looking at uh, five long-term outcomes and long-term survival, uh, there's a lot of information, a lot of patient benefit, a lot of metrics that that are still happening during the case that aren't captured if you're only looking at the rate of positive margins identified with the fluorescence. And that's what they were trying to describe here um, in, in, in sort of 
in the schematic in figure one, the four Baker basic applications of fluorescent scattered surgery began with excision with tumor free margins. We know that, um, but also debulking procedures, identification of uh, clinically occult lesions, and identification of vital structures. Uh, all of these are available uh, for you to, to register and record instances during the case where these sort of patient benefits occurred, um, whether it's the change in the duration of the surgery, uh, any complications, any change in the surgical, surgical strategy or the surgical plan prior to surgery, which we see that in a lot of our cases. Um, but it's, it's overall that they wanted to impact of the fluorescent scattered surgery on intraoperative decision-making uh, is, is most effective in objective outcome measurement that is independent of institution variance um, and can be compared across cancer types, tumor types, and, and fluorescence tracers, agents, and devices, for example. Uh, and so those of us that are conducting these clinical trials prepare to one day take them to the FDA. Uh, a lot of this information, the bulk of the information is still there to be captured beyond identification of positive margins using fluorescence. So I recommend everyone who's in this field, please go and read this Lancet Oncology Review. It reads more like a white paper, but uh, it's, it's very elucidating. So thank you, everyone. Um, I want to remind everybody, membership is free. Join today uh, to the International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery. This allows us to work together as one voice uh, and to, to expedite adoption, which is, which is something that we both know is coming and will uh, uniquely benefit patients and, and surgical procedures. So thank you. Well, Jason, thank you very much. I have a couple of uh, questions for you. So how many dyes are being studied uh, today? So we know that in, in Japan or in Asia, they, they have like banks of like 3,000 uh, dyes, but actually in the, um, in, in, what, what are the, the, what is the number of, and, and, and what are the types of tumors that are uh, most studied? Squamous cell carcinoma, uh, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, what are they, what are we studying nowadays? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, uh, the number of dyes out there, um, I certainly can't quantify. Uh, the number of dyes that are in clinical trial uh, actually gets a lot smaller. Uh, and I'd say probably in terms of tumor targeting agents um, that are using uh, antibody or even large peptide motifs, the iodine 100 is, is still number one. If you if you Google or if you clinicaltrials.gov fluorescent scatter surgery, you'll find that the bulk of them are testing with that. Iodine 700 is following quick behind, um, but primarily because in the 700, uh, that dye is a is a photosensitizer, so you can you can use it for photodynamic therapy, and a lot of uh, tumors can be amenable to that. Um, in terms of of tumor types, uh, initially, as we all know, um, uh, GBM was the first the first target um, for for you know fluorescent scattered surgery with with tumor bearing patients. Uh, and the reason was is because they could very quickly measure uh, survival in those in those cohorts, uh, which is what Stumer did some 20 years ago uh, in Germany, and he could identify within a short years which patients uh, had a, had longer outcomes when they fluorescent scattered surgery was used to remove their tumor, and that was done with 5 ALA. Um, so since then, uh, and I wrote a review about this some years ago. Um, tumor types that are amendable to fluorescent scattered surgery because not all tumor types are going to benefit from this. Um, there are some tumors that are excised and debulking. There are some tumors like GPM, for example, where um, total tumor removal is, is not realistic. And oftentimes there's still tumor left in there. So uh, using a sensitive tracer that, that, that allows you to chase down that infiltrative edge is not necessary for GBM. Um, and then there's other tumors like breast cancer, for example, where um, the, the tumor is deep, the way the procedure is done, there's, it's not amendable to imaging in, in the traditional sense. So there's no, you can't get a camera in there. The interoperative is shut down, but the ex vivo is still very much, the pathology, the histology piece is still very much, not only a, an indicator, a prognostic indicator of, of outcomes, but 
it's it's still there and and can be imaged and can change outcomes um so i hope that answers your question yeah thank you very much and you know uh in in our practice every time that we're going to start using a new technology one of the things that we we really need to know is how safe the new technology is and, and when we started using icg in the sign in green you know it has been approved in 1959 and you know the, yeah. the adverse effect of the of the dye it's really very low and this make us much easier to start using a new technology so and my question to you is when when we start studying these uh, dyes, what what's the evidence? How safe they are in comparison, you know, with ICG or with other dyes that we may use? Um, yeah. That's a good question. They, um, and and if we used our dye hundred, for example, um, the they had a master drug file available at the FDA very very early on, where they did safety studies in in rats. Um, and maybe maybe in other species, uh, and and they had that available for others to reference. And the reason that they did that was strategic because they felt that as these fluorescence guided agents would become come online and go into patient use, the the agent that had the most characterized toxicity and safety profiles would be the ones that were selected first. Uh, and so, in in the case of iodine hundred, for example. Uh, because that safety, that individual agent or molecule was already known, uh, when they asked for safety trials with your conjugated material, um, it was it was a very easy t experiment to do in in macaques or, or or pigs or or some other large species, and that's to test the fluorescent labeled compound with the non fluorescently or unlabeled compound, and if you could show that the safety and toxicity and and that you know the pharmacodynamics and kinetics and and you know by distribution were the same, uh, then the FDA gave you a pass and you got your IND approved. So so that's one strategy. Um, and but there but there are others like um, the, the the nerve agents that um, somebody like Summer Gibbs is bringing online, where um, these are these are fluorescent molecules that uh, specifically bind to nerve. And so in those cases, those are brand new. We're gonna to have to go through heavy CMC regulation and uh, to seek FDA approval, um, particularly if they're, if they're uh, administered intravenously. Very nice. And, and then uh, my last question to you, and you know, I, I would uh, like you to uh, give a, a couple of home messages, home take messages uh, for everybody that started with the technology. So. What is the the according to what you have seen uh, in the OR or in your hospital? What is the learning curve? So someone that has no idea about uh, this kind of technology is easy to start. They need to to be trained. Uh, is intuitive, so it's very easy uh, to understand. So what what's your uh, thing about thoughts about that? Yeah, that, that that is a really great point, uh, Dr. Dip. I can't tell you, um, in my experience, uh, and, and I'm in the OR every time we have a trial patient, and I'm in there every second that this is happening, and I'm looking over the, the surgeon's shoulder, I'm communicating uh, to try to understand uh, what are their limitations for, for the use of the technology. And we have done, um, we, we've done a lot of patients, 50 60, I lost count. Uh, and um, those, those surgeries were done amongst uh, 12 to 15 surgeons. And so we were able to get a good sense of uh, new surgeons that were using it for the first time. How well was it received? Uh, how well did they understand what they were looking at? And then we also had surgeons like our current surgeon uh, that were, uh, had, been, had been using the technology and, and with each patient, they got more uh, attuned, uh, more learned about what they're looking at, what it's telling them, and how they can use it. Uh, particularly on the deep surface of tumors in the in the in the in the robotic surgeries, uh, it, there's a there is a learning curve um, to scanning, but both the deep surface of the tumor and the wound bed uh, to find 
uh, occult, occult tumor that was left there relative to the normal background. And so once you remove that big bulk tumor, that's basically a giant spotlight, um, things get quiet in there. And so you, you have to know how, how to use this technology, know what a false positive looks like, know that off-site fluorescence uh, that's typically autofluorescence isn't something that you need to concern yourself with. I, I do believe that in the, in the, in the and, and you can speak to um, the passive use of, of ICG, but in the tumor targeting for surgical oncology, there is a learning curve. It's not, it's not big. It's not anything that the surgeons can't handle. Certainly if neurosurgery is rolling an MR into their operating room to do intraoperative MRI during the case, uh, they, can, they can shine a camera on, on a glowing tumor uh, during the case. So, Excellent. Yeah. I have a question from Steven Stetson. Uh, he said in, in the slide where the fluorescent could be seen through the uh, dura for the eight hours after administration, what was the agent and wavelength being measured? That was that was ICG, uh, and they in the in the second what we're calling the second window imaging. Um, the right here. So in terms of the camera, they were the device they were using. Um, I'm not entirely sure. A lot of those stereo microscopes and surgical scopes that they use uh, have onboard fluorescence imaging capabilities. Um, this, this, the, you know, the technical, you know, uh, strength of those scopes is varies, but um, this was ICG. Uh, and I, I imagine it was imaged using a surgical microscope with a 600 long pass filter. Uh, so it picked up everything that was in the NIR range and given 24 hours prior to surgery. Okay, Jason, uh, I, I would really like to thank you so much for, for the, uh, being here today, uh, for giving this, uh, this webinar. I really enjoyed it uh, very much. If you want to give a, a closer um, a closer remarks or or hope take messages, uh, and then you know I, I wait uh, for you all uh, to the next webinar. So Jason, if you want to close it, uh, sure. So um, thank you again, everybody. Uh, I think key points uh, right now and today moving forward is uh, the the continued adoption of the technology. Um, and into routine medical use. This, this needs to happen through word of mouth, patient, patients, um, marketing, social media, um, and, and things of that like, so that the, the, the general public who, um, who, who, who don't even really understand uh, the surgical procedure itself, but they can understand that their tumor is, is lit up for the surgeon and providing another tool for that surgeon in their toolbox uh, to successfully remove all of their cancer, the patients understand that and they, uh, they understand it well. Uh, so uh, get out there, spread the word, join the society um, and, and uh, we'll continue to grow this technology until it, it is what you and I envision it to be in some period in the future is, is a, a routinely used in surgical use. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Good, good, good morning, good, good afternoon, good night, everybody. See you soon in the next one. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.